If you were here last night, maybe you weren't last night, uh, we had a great night, Feast of Faith. Uh, I gained five more pounds. I do not need to be doing that, all right? That's not good. Ryan, wherever you are, no thank you. Appreciate you. Don't, don't, I don't need no more pounds, buddy. But that food was good. That food was good. And so uh, if you don't mind, I just want to say thank you to Ryan. Did a great job organizing it. But the guys that cooked and uh, Fred and Mickey, they came out here and brought Old Blue out here. Did anybody ride Old Blue last night, kids? Anybody? Well, they're not in here, so you know, they're not in here. <laughs> but uh, they did a fantastic job. Honestly, it was just so seamless. It was nice just to kind of sit back and see it all. Um, uh, Big Lee, he was our, our special guest la- last night. And uh, we had five decision cards come in that chose Christ last night. Amen. <laughs> right? That's what it's about. And so uh, this morning, Big Lee, if you come on up, it's my, my pleasure to introduce you to you. Now, let me just say this. I'm glad Big Lee's here. But this is going to be the third week that I've not been able to preach. So I'm going to tell you this. Next week, you better pack your lunch, okay? (laughs) Pack your lunch, unless I get vetoed uh, next week by the Holy Spirit. But y'all get up for Big Lee one more time. Love you, buddy. Love you. Thank you, Pastor Scott. I feel obligated to say this before I say anything else. Uh, If this is your church... And it's been your church for a while. I I just feel obligated to tell you, if you think what's happening at Harrison Faith is happening everywhere, I'm sad to tell you you're wrong. I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit last night when I parked right next to the grills. (laughs) I got here a little late this morning. We went and ate breakfast this morning at Fellowship, my I dozed off a little bit, got a little late, and I came in here on two wheels at about 10.01, and still 13 people greeted me with a genuine smile and a sweet spirit before I could get from the door to the sanctuary. I commend you for that. I got to speak on Monday and Tuesday in Savannah, Georgia, to the Georgia District Assembly of God, I mean, excuse me, a pastor's retreat to all the pastors that were there. And uh, it, it, it was such a high honor. However, there was one session I just sat in on that I wish that I hadn't. Less than 4% of Assembly of God churches worldwide in 2022 grew at all. 51% of churches in the Assemblies of God in the continental United States recorded less than 10 salvations and water baptisms for the year. What is happening here is special. And it's, I just want you to know that. And I want you to guard the anointing that God has put on this place. And I want you to be looking for lost people to get in this house. Revival is here, but it is not here fully yet. It is coming So I want to hear from my brother, your pastor, that revival is still growing. What's going on here? He sat at breakfast and just told me miracle after miracle after miracle. I just want to commend you for that. Let's pray. Lord, we do not have to pray for your word to be anointed because it's already anointed. But we do pray, first of all, that I don't mess this up. I don't muddy the water. This is really not about me. Even though I feel a great responsibility because you will hold me accountable for the few minutes I had this morning at this church. But Lord, we do say that you'll help me and that you'll prepare our hearts. Lord, it is a sacred truth that the same sunshine that hardens red clay, melts red wax. Soften our hearts this morning. Lord, as I strive to be used of you, completely dependent upon you, Holy Spirit, we felt your presence so strong during worship. Let that continue. We yield to you, your plan, Lord, not our plan. In your precious name we pray. And everybody said... 
So what do you do <clears throat> when you don't know what to do? What do you do when there's no template? How do we respond when we don't know how to respond? I think that as spirit-filled, born-again Christians, we would say the greatest hope for our country with its many issues right now is genuine revival. And revival is spreading across this country. And it came from no personality or no power figure. It came from college campuses is where it's beginning. And there's no personalities involved. There's a humility and a hunger for genuine revival. How do, what, how do we, what, do, what do we do? I heard Dr. Rutland tell a story last year. And I want to share it with you. Uh, about what we do when we don't know what to do. So I don't know about you, but I was guilty during the shutdown of saying things like, we've never seen anything like this before. We have nothing to go by. We don't know what to do. And to a great degree in our lifetime, that was true. But you don't have to go very far back in history to have things to relate to what we were going through too. And I heard about something, and I began to research it and because it, it, it just caught my attention. But in 1738, 1738 in London, England, they faced something that devastated the culture. Matter of fact, it devastated the very life of London, England. It was called the gin craze. The G-I-N, the liquor drink, gin, hit London, England in 1738 there was so many amounts of it, and it was so cheap that it devastated society. Spousal abuse was off the chain. Sex trafficking was off the chart. Unemployment, lack of work, it absolutely devastated London, England, and nobody had a clue what to do. They had no idea how to bring it to an end. Nobody knew what they were going to do. This will sound hard to believe, and I challenge you to double check me because I don't want you just to take my word for it. But in 1738, there were 7,000 gin bars in the London, England area. And the most popular sign being made in 1738 in sign shops across England was, come and get drunk here for a penny. Devastated. Devastated. Nobody knew what to do. At that time, there were two brothers, two young men that graduated from Oxford University in London, England, and they were hungry and desperate for God. And they wanted to do something sacrificial for God. So they decided they would be missionaries. And when they prayed about where they would be missionaries, of all the places in the world, they thought they could do the most good and serve their best sacrificially in the colony of Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. They were going to come to Savannah and be missionaries to Native American Indians. And when they landed in Savannah, they were here a few weeks and never saw a Native American Indian. But they were highly educated. When people began to realize their pedigree, their education, they put them to work. And one of the brothers went to work for General Oglethorpe, the founder of the colony and state of Georgia, and became his administrative assistant and really immediately became the second most powerful man in this new colony of Georgia. The other brother, the younger brother, when they saw that he had a biblical language degree from Oxford, they made him the pastor, the parish priest of a church of England that was there in Savannah. It was a very successful group of people. It was a very wealthy group of people and influential group of people. And the younger brother, John, was not prepared. He could preach okay, but he was about five foot four. He, he was nasally sounding when he talked. And the first thing that happened to Paul John is he got smitten by a southern Georgia bell. This young girl in his congregation just lightning bolted him. Now guys, you know what I'm talking about. 
It's happened to you. Maybe it have happened to you with the person you're sitting next to. I mean, you quit eating. You start howling at the moon. I think in the movie Bambi, they called it twitter pated. You get twitter pated. He publicly proposed to this young lady. He was so smitten with her, and she publicly rejected him. He was so lovesick and humiliated and embarrassed, he didn't know what to do. He was mad and bitter. And here's the truth. The next Sunday when he was serving communion to the congregation, when he got to this young lady, he passed her by. <laughs> Not knowing that, one of the foundational rules of the church was the only reason you could refuse a single lady the, 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 the privilege of having communion was if you knew without a shadow of a doubt she had been sexually promiscuous. She had a very important and influential father, and he sued John for fraud. Now, I don't know if you know how prison worked in 1738, but when you got sued, if you lost a lawsuit, they just put you in jail until it was settled, until it was paid. So if you lost a big fraud case, it could be a life sentence. John had no idea what to do. He snuck through the swamps of Savannah and found his brother about midnight, and they went into General Oglethorpe. And General Oglethorpe pardoned him and sent him home back to London on a boat in the middle of the night. I've read John's journal. Some of the things he wrote down in his personal journey on his way home. Love sick, humiliated, defeated, failure. One of the things he wrote was, I went to Georgia to save the Indian. Oh God, who will save me? Questioning everything he had ever been called to do and ever been taught to do. When he got back to London, because he was bilingual, he got a job teaching the book of Romans to some Monrovian students who had come to Oxford for a semester. While he was teaching Romans, he came across a phrase that he had heard before, but he had never let it sink into his spirit. We are justified by faith. It warmed his heart. Revival started. And through that revival that ended up becoming the second biggest worldwide revival since the second chapter of the book of Acts, the Wesleyan revival, John and Charles Wesley. Now, who would have thought the answer to the gin craze was a five foot four nasally talking love sick preacher. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We do what's most important first with excellence. Genesis chapter one. Let's go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless. Everybody say formless. And empty. Everybody say empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the earth had a few problems in the very foundations that we can identify with. Not only will it help us in our walk with God, it will help us in our marriages. It will help us in discipling other people. We have to know what to do when we don't know what to do. Now, first thing it says is the earth was formless, which means there was a lack of form. And when there's a lack of form or standard or rule, it brings chaos. Let, let me prove it to you like this. You ever come to a red light that's not working? Now, in the state of Arkansas, I checked it this morning. state of Arkansas, if you come to a red light that is not operating, you're supposed to treat the red light like a four-way stop. But you can go through three four-way stops on the way to a red light that ain't working. And when you get to the red light that ain't working, everybody navigated the four-way stops with perfection. 
But when they get to a light where there's not a light now and there used to be a light, it brings chaos. Everybody is jutting out. Nobody really knows what to do. When there was a light and now there is no light, it brings confusion. What do we do when our life is chaotic? What do we do when the list is that long of things that need to happen? We first, we do what's most important first. I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, I watched a lot of TV. I mean, too much. I was, we, we were trying to find stupid stuff to watch. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know this. I don't know if I shared this with you, Pastor Scotty, but I did my first marathon during COVID. I did. It was a Seinfeld marathon. It took three days and a bunch of puffy Cheetos, but I pulled it off. I powered through it. One of the things I did stumble on that I have made uh, a state in my repertoire is called the X Games. Now, I don't know if you know what the X Games is. It's on ESPN. It's called, it stands for Extreme Sports, and they do crazy stuff. Most especially, I like the motorcycles. So they take these little bitty motorcycles that are made out of aluminum aircraft alloy, and they're made out of NASA-designed lightweight Kevlar, and they basically have jet engines on them. And they just will go up a U-ramp and do 13 flips in the air. And it reminded me of somebody in my childhood. Because in my childhood, we had a guy. Now, he didn't have a Kevlar, NASA-designed, aluminum craft, alloy, jet engine, special motorcycle. He just had a Harley Davidson. And he just knocked everything off of it. And he got him a white leather suit and a cape. Now, I want every man knowing that God is listening to you and watching you at this very moment, every man in this church, to raise your hand if you, as a child, did not find blocks or bricks and scrap lumber and build a ramp to jump on your bicycle. Raise your hand. Did you go extreme? Did you get one of your mama's old towel and some safety pins and make you a cape? Because evil Knievel had a cape. Did you go more extreme than that? Did you take clothespins and playing cards and put a few of them in the spokes of your bicycle so it would sound like a motor running? All inspired by evil Knievel. Now, young people, go with me. I'm not here to preach against skinny jeans or funny haircuts. I love young people. I still preach five weeks of youth camp every year. I love you. But I'm trying to give you some perspective so you can go with us, okay? Just go with me. You got to remember at this time, TV's had three channels. Three channels. No way to record anything live on TV. If you were not there when it happened live, you'd never see it again. It was gone. There was no DVR, no VCR, no on-demand, nothing. If you missed it, you missed it. Also, when you bought a brand new TV, when I was a kid, it didn't come with a remote. I was the remote at my house. Somebody raise your hand if you were the television remote at your house. Did anybody ever been called from the outside of the house to the inside of the house to change a channel for your daddy? Has anybody ever put tin foil on a rabbit ear and touched it to a filling in your tooth to try to get the Braves game to come on for your daddy? We even had high-def TV. We got one of them big antennas outside, and they would send me to the roof. Twist it a little more. She's still a little fuzzy. That was HD TV. Well, back in those days, Evil Knievel made an announcement on the ABC Wild World of Sports that in two months he was in Wembley, England, going to jump 13 Greyhound buses. It's all we talked about for two months. Live. Now, young people, go with me. Go with me, young people. There's no tape delay. So, I mean, if he hits bus number 11 going 90 miles an hour... We're going to see it live and in color. That's all we talked about for two months. My whole neighborhood was at my house. My mama made snacks. The whole neighborhood's in my living room. 
I'll never forget, she made red Kool-Aid and she got bought those flour cookies. Do anybody remember those little flour cookies you used to put on your pinky and eat around? They were terrible. They were terrible. They were hard as King Kong's kneecap and they tasted like wood glue. But you could get 199 of them for 75 cents, couldn't you? I'll never forget, it was Evil Knievel that taught me what to do when you don't know what to do when your life is chaotic. It was the answer to question number three. So I don't know if you ever watched Evil Knievel jump, but he comes out first on a little trick bike. He does some donuts and rides wheelies. He's undone that. Then he tests the ramp about 10 times till your heart's about to explode. And they made the announcement, the next time he comes down this ramp, he's going to jump these buses. And a guy named Frank Gifford, he's an NFL Hall of Famer and his mustard yellow ABC Wide World of Sports blazer and a microphone about that long goes over and asks Evil Knievel three questions. He said, Evil, how fast you got to be going to clear 13 buses, 168 feet? And Evil Knievel laughed at him. He said, I don't know. He said, I ain't got no speedometer on this motorcycle. We knocked that off a long time ago. Now, Gifford should have knew that, and it embarrassed him. Now, you got to realize there's 13 million people watching this. Still the greatest broadcast in the history of the ABC Wide World of Sports. 13 million people. He embarrasses him. Question number two. Well, I notice when you get about halfway across, you kind of pull up on the front tire. How do you know when to do that? Evil Knievel laughed at him again. He said, I don't know, Frank. He said, it ain't like I got time to count buses. <laughs> it's just instinct. When I feel like I pull up, I pull up. But it was question number three that if I live to be 100, I'll never forget. Old Gifford rallied. I'll give it to him. He rallied. He said, what's the last thing you think when you're going down that ramp? I was shocked at the answer. Eva Knievel said, we pulled to the exact middle to the millimeter of the launch ramp. And we take two pieces of duct tape and we make an X. And he said, I ain't thinking about how fast I'm going and I'm not thinking about when to pull up on the front tire. The one and only thing I'm thinking is drive that tire through the X. He said, because if I miss it this far on the launch ramp, 168 feet later, I will miss the entire landing ramp. Now, Eva Knievel's ex looked like that. But mine and yours is a cross. Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith. Avoid the things that trip you up and dodge or avoid to cast off the things that slow you down. Avoid the things that trip you up. Keep your eyes fixed on him, run in your lane, and never, never, never quit. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We go back to the very fundamentals of the faith. We go back to where we began our relationship with the Lord, and we do those things with excellence. If we want to end up where we're going, we better do what we did first. We do what's most important first with excellence. Then he said the, the, the earth was empty what do we do when our life gets empty? What do we do when our walk with God seems like we're just gritting our teeth and powering through just because it's the right thing to do? It took me a long time to learn this lesson. But let me tell you what. What you can do, and it works 100% of the time, is go back to where you quit being grateful. When you quit being grateful for the daily and the moment, momentary blessings of God. I've been married 35 years. July 23rd be 35 years. I'm taking my wife to Hawaii. Never been on a trip like that. We're going to Hawaii. I wish my wife could be here today. She's a school teacher. There's no way she travels with me very little during the school year. But you would love her. I'm six foot. I'm 6'4", she's 5 foot. <laughs> I don't call her sugar. I call her sweet and low. She's that tall right there. 
She got an Alabama smile, make a puppy pull a freight train. She is my favorite human being on this earth. I love you guys, but I love her so much more than I'll ever love you. She is my number one. Do you hear me? Numero uno. Wendy Wu. We've been married 35 years. And sometimes I have to leave the house real early. Sometimes it's for ministry. Sometimes it's go duck hunting. 35 years. Never fails. No matter what time. Even if she's going to work and I'm not that day, I'm out of bed two hours for her. I just get up early. That's just me. When I roll out of that bed, she rolls over with her right hand and scratches my back. Just a second. Love you. The minute that I quit appreciating that back scratch, my marriage starts to suffer. Go back to where you quit being grateful for your salvation. Go back to where you quit expecting God to do things and you're grateful for what God is doing in your life every day. The minute you quit being grateful, your life becomes obligatory. It becomes empty. You're doing things just because you think it's the right thing to do. What is our strength? Our strength is not discipline. We need discipline. But discipline is not our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Go back and find your joy. And your life will never be empty. I was speaking at an FCA, excuse me, I was speaking at a men's breakfast about a year ago in the Okefenokee Swamp. These guys did a men's retreat in the Okefenokee Swamp. And I get there, and I'm looking, and I don't usually eat till everything's over. And I'm looking, and they got a bunch of guys there and not a lot of bacon. It's going to be close. Now you talking about a men's meeting going south, you run out of bacon with men still in the line. I thought, I ain't going to eat because it's going to be close. And it was close, but they made it. So I had to leave there and drive to Macon, Georgia, and speak at an FCA fundraiser at lunch. I didn't have time to stop. And I'm telling y'all, I'm hungry. I'm about ready to eat my elbow. But one thing I can't do is stop. One thing COVID killed, no matter how you feel about COVID, mass, whatever, one thing COVID killed, everybody will agree, is the fast food line. It killed it. I ain't got time to stop. And I pulled through McCray, Georgia, and like every little Georgia, every little town in South Georgia, you go around a town square. And I looked over there on the corner, and it was a dude over there had written on a cardboard sign, boiled peanuts. Now, I don't know how you feel about boiled peanuts, but in my heart, they truly are the caviar of the South. I love boiled peanuts. I said, I could do that. I whoop over, how much for a cup of boiled peanuts? He said, the big cup's $5. I said, give me two. And just on a whim, just on a whim, I asked the guy, hey, if you had something to drink, I wouldn't have to stop again. I might make my thing on time. He said, well, I'm about to go home. I'm about sold out. He said, and I brought two drinks with me, but my little refrigerator's tore up, and they're about half frozen. But you give me a dollar piece for each one of them, I'll give them to you. I said, what is it? He said, a grape knee-high. <laughs> Church, I'm just confessing this to you <laughs> this morning. If I was on death row, and the warden came in there the night before, you got one more meal, big boy. <laughs> what you want it to be. It very well may be great knee-high and boiled peanuts. <laughs> I wept on the way to my next gig. The Lord still loves me. Look what he has done for me today. Now you say that's a silly little story, and it is. But the minute we quit being grateful for the things that God does for us, the minute we try to only expect for God to do things for us, that's why I said earlier, you protect the anointing that is in this church. You thank God every night your head hits the pillow for what God is doing in this church. You thank God for those five people who raised their hand and yielded their life to Jesus Christ last night. 
and their name was written in a book of life. And the minute we quit being grateful, our life starts being empty. Then it says it was dark. Now, if you was a Christian in the 90s, we know about darkness. We pierce the darkness. We engage the darkness. And I'm not making light of it. I'm glad I read those books. I'm glad I watched those videos. But I learned really easy how to overcome darkness. Now, when I say it's easy, I don't want you to think that I'm belittling the darkness in your life because I'm not. Because darkness is real. Is this okay? You sure? You mean mugging me, Pastor Scott? Are we good? Give me a smile. I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's one thing that is undefeated against darkness. Light. We just sang about it. Light it up. Man, that was good, wasn't it? I went deep sea fishing one time. And the captain told me this story. He said, last week we had some guys out here from Ufall, Alabama. Went out of Panama City Beach, Florida. We went deep sea fishing. The reason that he was telling me a story is because we weren't fishing. If you ever go deep sea fishing and the captain says the night before, it's going to be a little choppy. It's going to be three to five foot waves. That means seven to nine foot waves. And what he means is he'd rather have all your money than just your deposit. I spent the entire fishing trip in a dead death grip with a pole. I never touched a fishing pole, nor did I ever stick my hand in the bait bucket. I thought I was on the deadliest catch. I prayed in the Holy Spirit every second of that trip. When we turned around and we're going back, he told me this story. We had these guys a couple weeks ago. We went out in the first wreck we stopped at. We limited. We filled the, the coolers up. We're supposed to fish till three. We're back at nine. We had such a good trip. They wanted to go again. They were only down here for a week. I said, well, I'm booked every morning. The captain told him. He said, but if you can come back one evening at three, we'll go fish one wreck. And that's what they did. The captain came in, emptied one group, washed the boat off a little bit, made sure he had plenty of bait, and they headed out again. When they got out again, they were five miles out, and they limited again. Immediately, just wore them out. <clears throat> when they started to come back in, they were about 30 minutes before dark. Everything on the boat, electrical, was gone. Now, usually he had backup batteries, but he didn't load his backup batteries because he don't take two groups usually in a day. They didn't have nothing, not a radio. They're trying to get their phones, no signal. They are in the Gulf of Mexico. It's fixing to go dark, and they got nothing, zero. Captain said he turned to him and said, those people that dropped y'all off today that came to the beach with y'all, do they love you? Now, how nervous would you be if that's what the quick captain asked you? <laughs> said, well, they'll call somebody. They'll, they'll, they'll find us. He said, plus boats will be coming in. We'll wave somebody down. Nobody comes by. Nine o'clock at night, they had a flare. They thought they heard a boat coming. They shot their only flare. They're in the Gulf of Mexico at midnight with nothing. Now, I don't know if you know how dark it gets in the Gulf of Mexico five miles out at midnight, but it's a different kind of darkness. So all of a sudden, they heard a helicopter. Said he came over and he swung right of the boat. They are jumping up and down. They wave in their shirts. They're jumping up and down. They're trying to do anything. But it's dark. I don't know if y'all know this, but your men's restroom in the gym, if you go sit down for a while, <laughs> y'all got that timer a little quick. <laughs> It'll go black on you in there. And waving your arm don't do any good. It happened to me yesterday. You got to get up and kick that stall door open to get that light to come back on. If I ever come back, I'm going to remember you about to play beat the clock in the men's bathroom in the gymnasium.
the helicopter doesn't stop. It goes way wide and turns, and it comes way wide on the other side. True story. They're waving, jumping, screaming. One of them old boys from Eufaula remembered that in his tackle box, he had a little one of them little old mini big lighters. You know, sometimes it's easier instead of biting the excess line off your lure, it's easier to burn it, and that's why he had it in there. Y'all, the big lighter's about this big. Rusted. He ain't lit it in a year. Now, y'all, come on. A big lighter versus the Gulf of Mexico at midnight? The helicopter comes. He's finally. He gets at the light a little bit. It's about big as your pinky nail. He's circling. Helicopter just keeps going. He said that he had, it ain't five minutes later. The Coast Guard pulls up next to him in a boat. They said, how in the world do you know where we were? I said, well, <clears throat> that guy said he thought he saw a little light. And the guy that was riding with him then put his infrared. He used his thermal, his night vision, to see if it was a light. Saw the boat, called into coordinates, and that's why we're here. I'm, I'm not making light of your darkness. Darkness is, is real and is scary. You know the most common need I pray with young people on the altar at youth camps today is? Anxiety. And you know what my generation is bad about doing? Making fun of their anxiety. We make light of it. We say, oh, if they start whipping kids at school again. You know, we, we got all these remedies. But I'm telling you, anxiety, if it's real, it's real. And it don't matter where it comes from. And I don't think we need to make light of it. I think we need to be there and listen and we need to tell them in the scripture that we cast those things upon our Lord because he truly cares for us. Yes. Darkness is real, but I'm telling you, light defeats darkness and Jesus Christ is the light of this world. And he has put a light in me and in you to be lights in the darkness. Last thing I'll say. Those are three pretty good points. I mean, I've been preaching a long time. I'm just going to tell you, them were pretty good. <laughs> I bet nobody thought that we would come this morning and the three main points would be evil, Knievel, boiled peanuts, and deep sea fishing. <laughs> but that ain't my favorite part of Genesis 1, 1 through 3. My favorite part says, the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Hovering. God is hovering in your life. God is hovering. So my first granddaughter turned four January 31st when she was learning how to walk. You know, when you're a grandparent, you kind of relive stuff. I don't remember teaching my kids how to walk. I don't even know that I did. Somebody else might have taught my kids how to walk. But when you're a grandparent, you don't miss nothing. I've not wasted one second of my granddaughter, either one of their lives. I'm there for everything. And I remember they put Leighton, and we call her Ladybug, they put Ladybug in that walker, and I forgot on a hard surface how fast a baby can be in them walkers. <laughs> she turned the corner going down the hall. I thought I heard her catch second gear. I mean, they can get it. So when it was just me and Ladybug, I would take our, 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 our living room stained concrete floors. I'd take the throw rug, move the coffee table, and I'd put on VeggieTales singing video. And man, we, were, we might as well have been running NASCAR at Bristol. I'm spinning her around. I done broke a sweat. She's running around. We are having a grand old time. When Wendy Wu got back, I had everything in place. I thought I had covered my tracks. <laughs> she said, you moved the throw rug? I said, yeah. How'd you know? She said, because that little rug under the throw rug, I had glued down. <laughs> she said, so when I clean the throw rug, I know where to put it back. She said, you can move the throw rug. Leave the liner down there. Yes, ma'am. As soon as they left again, took that throw rug up, but I left the liner down, and here goes Ladybug and that walker. <laughs> She would hit that liner the wheel, with the wheel of that walker and just 
bam, just abrupt stop. She'd back up, get red in the face, build up momentum, bam, an obstacle she couldn't overcome. Matter of fact, I knew she was kin to me. I see her mama in her lot, and I see her grandmama in her lot, and I see her daddy in her lot, but I don't see me in her several much. What, this is when I said, that's Pop's granddaughter. She tried to pick up the walker she was sitting in <laughs> and set the wheel over the ledge. She could not overcome it. She tried, y'all. She tried. And she was so frustrated. But what she could not fix with all her might, Pop was hovering. And I could fix it in less than one second. I'll swoop in, pick her up, walk her and all, set her the other side of her obstacle, and it's let it rip, tater chip. <laughs> Pop was hovering in her life, and God is hovering in your life. He is a very present help in the time of need. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask or even think to ask. Stand with me this morning. Caleb, can some of y'all come back? Could we end with that lighted up song? I don't, am I throwing you a curveball there? Is that all right? I love that dude. I, he got a sweet spirit about him. If you were here this morning <clears throat> and your life is chaotic, you don't have a template, you're facing something you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. You say, Lee, I'm not sure what to do. We're going to pray this morning that God is going to show you what to do first and then next. Doesn't the scripture say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness then all these things will be added unto you. Have you ever studied the word things in that verse? He ain't talking about lake houses and RVs and motorcycles. He ain't talking about extras. He was answering a question about what are we going to eat and where are we going to sleep tonight? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. If that is you, every head up, every eye open, just wave your hand at me right now. Big Lee, I'm facing something and I do not know what to do. My life is chaotic. Just wave your hand at me. I'm facing a situation. Could the prayer team that was up here a few minutes ago, could some of you guys come back and help us to pray? Thank you so much, guys. If that is you, and your life is formless and it's led to chaos and you don't know what to do and you need God to show you what to do first, just come on. Just come on this morning. One of us will pray with you. We're not going to bow our heads. We're not going to wait to sing. We're going to sing that song in a few minutes as a celebration of victory. Just come on. You say, oh, he's one of them evangelists. It's got to have the altar full. No, I ain't. I'm a preacher's kid. I don't believe in manipulating moments. But I'm also somebody who has learned there's something about making a move toward God amongst your brothers and sisters. There's something about making a move toward Him. This is the safest room in the state of Arkansas to make a move toward God. There ain't an ounce of judgment in this room. We ain't nothing but love and appreciation for what you're going through. Because many people have been through what you're going through. Come on. If your life is empty, you say, Lee, if I was to, if, if a video, if they recorded me over the last week, I can't think of one grateful thing that came out of my mouth. A lot of complaints. A lot of bitterness, a lot of justification, but I, I can't hear myself look in my wife and I and say, baby, look, whoa, 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 look at me. Right here. I love you so much. I appreciate you so much. You do things I could never do. My wife can do more on accident than I can do on purpose. 
She's a whirlwind. It's absolutely amazing. She multitasks. I have to stop her, baby. I see what you do for us. If you haven't heard you say something that's grateful toward God, remember the scripture, the principle that out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. So if it ain't coming out of your mouth, it ain't in your heart. And if you want that to change, if you'll come this morning and just repent of being bitter, if you'll come this morning and just repent of just doing things in your own strength and not the joy of the Lord, God will restore your joy. He will restore your joy. And you just begin thanking Him, thanking Him, thanking Him for what He has done. If you're facing darkness, if you're in a dark spot, run to the light. Run to the light this morning. If you're not in a dark spot, just remember God has given you the light. He's called us to be light in the darkness. If you need to come to this altar, I want you to come right now. If the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart, I don't want you to wait. I don't have anything else left to say. I just want you to come, and I'm going to promise you two things. You will not be in this altar alone, and God will meet your need. God will meet your need. Praise you, Jesus. So we're going to do one of two things. You're either praying or we're fixing to worship together. Pastor will close this out in a few minutes however he sees fit. If I could pray with you, I'd love to pray with you. We're either praying with someone or we're worshiping and we mean every syllable that comes out of our mouth as if we were at the foot of the throne because we are this morning.